Um, ladies and gentlemen, he is a playwright, he is an author, and he is a humorist. And his name is Dylan Brody. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, Tony, thank you so much for letting me tell this story on this night. Um, it is an honor to be here. In my early 30s, I began to fear that I simply wasn't funny enough to die young. It, part, part of my understanding of the comedy world was that an early death was the surest route to immortality. Certainly the quickest. And no one was comparing me to Lenny Bruce and, and nobody was comparing me to Bill Hicks. And I started to shift my focus to my writing to think about a, a, a literary legacy rather than a legacy of comedic potential unfulfilled. And right around this time, a friend made me aware that George Carlin was going to be at a party at a nightclub very near to my home in Studio City. So I took a chance. It wasn't a big chance that I took. It cost me nothing. I, I put a videotape of my stand-up reel in a manila envelope with a letter that said, you're one of my heroes, I love your work, I hope you'll enjoy some of mine. And I wrote on the envelope, for George Carlin, please hold for arrival, and I dropped it off at the nightclub. And on the way back to my car, I thought about how cool it was that George Carlin might watch my work on a television in the way that I had watched his work when I was a child. I adored him as a child. When I saw him on television, his rhythms were so natural, his jokes so conversational that I could instantly memorize an entire routine. And the next morning, I would recite them word for word over my syrup-soaked toaster waffles. <laughs> I remember my father saying, that's not yours, Dylan, you didn't write that. <laughs> Eleven years old, I was learning about intellectual property rights. I would watch anything I thought might have George on it. I would lie on the floor of our cold upstate New York house with my head resting against Dusty, the great matted sheepdog mutt of my youth, through insufferable hours of Sonny and Cher and the Mac Davis When You're Hot, You're Hot show. Because <laughs> I had seen George on Flip Wilson and in my young mind, all comedy variety shows were probably pretty much the same thing, drawing from the same pool of talent. And when he didn't show up, Dusty would comfort me with his nose snuffling me. Dusty, let me say, never died. Um, when I was about 15 or 16, he left home. And we thought he had gone off to the woods to die because we were told that's what dogs do. But then several months later, he came back well-brushed and very clean. <laughs> and my father called a number on a tag on his collar and a man answered and my father said are you missing your dog and the man said no my dog is lying next to me and my father said well our dog just came home after apparently a lengthy vacation <laughs> and he had your number on his collar and the man said well is your dog wearing a red collar and my father said yes and the man said well my dog lost a red collar a couple of months ago so my father hypothesized that Dusty had mugged the man's dog, <laughs> stolen his collar, and adopted the new identity to enter the underground dog revolutionary army. The man whose dog had lost the expensive collar was not amused by this. After a milkbone, Dusty ran off again, but for the remainder of the time that we lived in that house, he would come back every few months looking well cared for. None of us has been back to Saratoga Springs for a long time now, but I am quite certain that Dusty is still there, uh, this immortal dog wandering from home to home, finding new kids to raise and see off to school and then finding a new place to live. But I digress. Um, in 1998, in the summer, I had totally given up on my stand-up career. I was focused on my writing, I was sending in a submission to Late Night with David Letterman every week. And they responded positively and they told me I was very talented and they never offered me a job and they never asked me for my social security number. <laughs> and one afternoon, as I was spiraling into the late stages of early onset midlife crisis, <laughs> the phone rang. 
and I picked it up. And a voice said, hi, Dylan, this is George Carlin. And I began to run through a Rolodex of friends who might adopt that identity as part of a prank. So I said, uh-huh. And the voice said, uh, listen, I just looked at your tape. I'm sorry it took me so long. It's been sitting on top of my VCR for six months. Your cover letter was touching and sincere. And I said, holy shit, it's really you. Because I'm very cool. And George said, yeah. Anyway, I didn't think it was polite just to leave you hanging without at least picking up the phone. You're really very funny, and I thoroughly enjoyed looking at your work. I should have been thrilled to hear this. I'm thrilled now to know that I did hear this from my hero, but at the time, I was sad and stoned, <laughs> deeply despondent over the direction my career seemed to be going. So what I said was, yeah, great, would you mind telling the assholes at Letterman that? And George said, oh, uh, let me call you back. And my hero hung up on me. Seven minutes and nine bong hits later, <laughs> the phone rang again, and I picked it up. And George said, all right, I called the woman I deal with over there when they book me. I told her you're a very funny young political comic, and they should take you seriously. Is that OK? It was. I said, are you kidding me? Yes, that's great. Yes. And he said, all right then. Well, take care and good luck with all of it, man. You're really very good. And he hung up again. I don't think I ever said thank you in this phone call. Um, here's the thing. It was a small thing for him to call me. It was a slightly larger thing for him to call Letterman on my behalf, but it cost him nothing. And it meant a great deal to me. As a young comic starting out, I believed that I could blaze my way into history with a six-gun wit. Now, walking the world, an adult grown older than I ever believed I would be, It's become pretty clear to me that immortality is not earned with one-liners, no matter how clever they are. Immortality is earned with a generosity of spirit toward those around us. It's earned with a kind gesture. I immortality is earned with a cold nose on a sad night. Thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah. My nose is cold.